Campbell & Company, I'd like to welcome you to Relationship Management 101, Finding the Right Prospects. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to quickly review some logistics for those of you who may be new to Campbell & Company webinars. So first, to make sure that you have the best uh, experience possible, please follow these tips. Close any programs other than GoToWebinars, of course, that are running on your computer. Call in using a telephone instead of your, uh, using your computer speakers. Move your cell phone away from your computer. And if you experience any visual issues, you can send a chat to Campbell & Company. You may also contact GoToWebinar at 1-800-263-6317. Finally, today's webinar will last 60 minutes, and you will earn one continuing education credit. That is good for certification with CFRE International. About an hour after the webinar, you will receive an email from GoToWebinar that includes a web address to download your certificate, the PDF of the presentation, as well as information on how to register for our next webinar. We do welcome questions throughout the session, so if you have any, please send a question to Campbell and & Company, and I will ask them throughout. So without further ado, I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce Carrie Dahlquist and Ann Clark. Carrie Dahlquist is the Director of Strategic Information Services at Campbell & Company. She helps organizations understand how complex information can impact the big picture and inform the decision-making process. She works with institutions to develop a roadmap that is both manageable and measurable. Terry holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business with concentrations in econometrics, strategy, and economics. Anne Clark is a research associate at Collins Group, a division of Campbell & Company. As Collins' lead prospect researcher, she has worked with many nonprofits to provide high-quality donor research to inform organizations' strategic direction and prepare staff and volunteers for donor meetings. Anne has her Master's of Library and Information Science from University of Washington and her Bachelor of Arts from Lewis and Clark College. Carrie? Great. Thanks, Sarah. Well, Anne and I are so excited uh, to be here with you all today, and I just want to take a moment to talk about what we're hoping to accomplish but also what really prompted this, um, this webinar. I think this is a really important topic uh, because so many of our clients have questions about the importance of research and how to do it right. Um, we, we've really decided to, for the purposes of today's discussion to focus in on research and how it really relates to relationship management. That's a big focus at, at Campbell and & Company. And we want to make sure that we are um, tying those two important uh, pieces of information together. So the goal for today is to talk a little bit about how to define a prospect, um, to review the various uh, prospect research resources that are out there, and then to really kind of dive in on how you refine your own approach to prospect research. And then finally, um, we want to discuss how we build, how we take steps to build our own um, identified prospect pool. Um, Sorry, everyone. Hang on one second. We're just having a little bit of a, a tech glitch. Sorry. <laughs> Hold on. What happened? I, I blinked on. Company, I'd like to welcome you to Relationship Management 101, Finding the Right Prospects. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to quickly review some logistics for those of you who may be new to Campbell & Company webinar. To ensure you have the best webinar experience, please follow these tips. First, close any programs other than GoToWebinars that are running on your computer. Two, call in using a telephone instead of using your computer speakers. Three, follow your cell, or move your cell phone away from your computer. And finally, if you experience any visual issues, send a chat to Campbell & Company, or you can contact GoTo at 800-263-6317. Finally, today's webinar will last 60 minutes, and you will earn one continuing education credit, and that is good for certification with CFRE International. About an hour after the webinar, you will receive an email from GoTo Webinars that includes a web address to download your certificate, information on how to access our YouTube channel where the video will be, and information on how to register for our next webinar. We welcome questions during the webinar, so if you have any, please send a question to Campbell & Company and I will ask them throughout. And now I'd like to take a moment to introduce Carrie Dawkins and Ann Clark, our speakers for today. Carrie Dawkins is the Director of Strategic Information Services at Campbell & Company. 
She helps organizations understand how complex information can impact the big picture and inform the decision-making process. She works with institutions to develop a roadmap that is manageable and measurable. Carrie holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business with concentrations in economic, econometrics, strategy, and economics. Ann Clark is a research associate at Collins Group, a division of Campbell Company. As Collins' lead prospect researcher, she has worked with many nonprofits to provide high-quality donor research to inform organizations, strategic direction, and prepare staff and volunteers for donor meetings. Ann has her Master's of Library and Information Science from University of Washington and her Bachelor of Arts from Lewis and Clark College. And at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to Carrie. Carrie? Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, well, Ann and I are so pleased to be with you here today. Um, we, uh, as you may know, this is the second webinar in our relationship management series. Um, and in our first, we really gave an overview about how Campbell and Company approaches relationship management, and we referenced at that time the importance of, of prospect research. So this is really an evolution and a deeper dive into talking through uh, how prospect research um, can impact and inform the relationship management process. Um, we uh, will have a couple of useful handouts that we just want to make you aware of at the outset that will be available um, at the close of the presentation, and we'll reference those throughout. And we're just really excited to, to dive in. So today we're going to talk about um, a straightforward definition that clarifies who a prospect is and isn't. Um, we hope to, to give you a, a, an overview of really useful prospect research resources, both those that are free and, and um, paid subscriptions. Um, we want to focus on a, a simple working structure for how you define um, an approach to prospect research and, and eventually really talk through the steps into building an identified prospect pool. Um, before we do that, however, we really want to talk about the importance of, of a team and, and, and how in relationship management um, in our clients and, and those that we discuss its importance with, um, it really relies on good people coming together around the process. And so we just want to take a moment and acknowledge who the key team players are in good and thoughtful relationship management. So you've obviously got your prospect researcher um, who is responsible for identifying capacity. Um, and that person is, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about the prospect researcher uh, and their role in identifying capacity. Uh, and also of really providing um, baseline indicators of inclination and interest. And those are going to be really important um, to help answer questions and drive conversation as we move forward. Um, the next, obviously, critical player of the team is the frontline officer. And building on the information that they receive from the researcher, the frontline officer's first responsibility is to either qualify or disqualify a prospect. And then for those um, prospects who are qualified to really develop, coordinate, and execute strategies around solicitation. And then finally, um, we wanted to acknowledge the role of management, the important role of management, um, both in kind of being responsible for the overall and the overarching picture of the, the prospect pool, making certain to, to review it regularly, um, and then tracking metrics for both program uh, and staff. So in a moment, we're going to talk about how this team works together. Uh, but before we do that, we wanted to, to spend just a second talking about how they can do that in an ethical way. Anne? Thanks, Carrie. Good afternoon, everybody. So I just wanted to spend a moment talking about the importance of uh, ethics when doing project research and donor management. We just want to make sure that we're diligent in talking about how these uh, can apply to your work. These are taken from APRA's Code of Ethics, but these can apply to everybody in your development, development department uh, who's doing any kind of donor management or research. Um, APRA, which is the Association Serving Professionals in Prospect Development, their Code of Ethics state simply that advancement researchers must balance an individual's right to privacy with the needs of their institutions to collect, analyze, record, maintain, use, and disseminate information. So there's a process for researching prospects and potential donors, which we'll get to in a little bit more detail in a moment. And there's a right and a wrong way to kind of approach that process. But what these do is that uh, what ethics do is just basically give you some standards and guidelines 
that can help make the process go smoothly, and most importantly, kind of give you a foundation so that you can frame all of your relationship management process. So the core kind of four areas of the fundamental principles are um, integrity, which is just to be truthful, accountability, which is to be respectful, practice, which is to um, remember that you are gatekeepers of donor information, and so that you want to put into uh, you want to put good practices and measures in place in your development department. And finally, conflicts of interest, which is basically remembering that all found information on your donors belongs both to the donor and to your organization. So kind of a good rule of thumb that I always follow when I am doing prospect research is to think about, would I feel comfortable if the donor read this profile that I've written on them? And if the roles were, if the roles were reversed, would I want this to be known about me? And what this basically does is just kind of set parameters for um, your not only research but also just tracking donor information and uh, wealth indicators that you uncover. So now that you have, now that we spent a minute talking about ethics and we have that out of the way and we've done our due diligence, let's move on and talk a little bit more about the fun stuff, which is deciding who makes a good prospect. Um, so when we're talking about a uncovering prospects and we're talking about what makes a quote-unquote good prospect, we have to remember that the goal of this entire process, which leverages various team members across your entire organization, is to uncover individuals that kind of fall into these three areas. Ideally, you're looking for people who have the capacity to make a major gift payable over five years or if you're if also looking for people who uh, will give to your annual fund. You're also looking for people who have affinity to your organization, either through strong relationships or engagement or volunteer service. And you're also looking for people who have linkage to your organization, um, as evidenced by either their giving history, their relationships to either other to key staff, to board members, to volunteers, to your organization. Now, when we're talking about capacity, affinity, and linkage, uh, we recognize that there are um, some ter like some of these terms are interchangeable. So sometimes when people are talking about affinity, they use the term inclination. When they're talking about capacity, they're talking about the ability. Um, and the key here is just to remember that you are looking for prospects who might be capable of making a gift, to, who might not only be capable of making a gift to your organization, but that they also have the interest and connections to your organization. Um, prospective donors who kind of have stronger natural, collect, natural connections to your organization, in addition to having the capacity to make a major gift, are better prospects for your um, organization. So um, just one second, everyone. I think we had a little bit of a tech issue with uh, Anne's phone. We seem to have lost her. We'll wait until she she rejoins us. Um, what are we? Can we just go on to the next slide, or what do we? Yeah, do we absolutely. Here? I think. Um, you know, it'll be important to get Anne's input when she's when she's able to, to rejoin, but I can certainly cue us up here. I think we were just about to, to shift gears and focus on where to find information, and, and Anne is going to be able to give us a deeper dive into these three areas, both um, those subscription-based services, free services, and then uh, she's got some input on her personal favorites, which I always find um, interesting and helpful. But I think, you know, in, in beginning to think through what you need to um, analyze the, these services, we just want to acknowledge that um, prospect research, or like any area in development, doesn't have unlimited resources. And so it really becomes important uh, to be able to think through what you want to accomplish, um, to be able to prioritize your needs, to have some sense of you know, what is a realistic budget to, to be able to, to um, realize those, those needs, and then you know, go through the exercise of, of seeing um, what's available and balancing paid and, and free services. So in the, the traditional services, you know, we've got, we've 
because I think these are ones that are probably familiar to many of you. Um, wealth screening databases, for example, like Target Analytics, and Wealth Engine, Donor Search, iWave, these are probably all um, names that, that sound familiar. And there are many more out there um, that probably sound familiar to you. I know um, we spend a lot of time looking at LexisNexis and Foundation Center. Um, typically, the, uh, the subscriptions start uh, around $3,500 a year, but I know, for example, that LexisNexis is, is more than that. So again, as we think about prioritizing needs and, and thinking through budget, it's going to be important to, to wrap your head around what information you can gather and, and how, um, how you go about uh, prioritizing for that. Typically, um, the resources that we just discussed, those screening databases, are going to give you insights into um, philanthropic giving as well as uh, hard assets, so somebody's real estate, um, securities that, um, and if they are if they are involved as a publicly traded company, we're going to have insights into perhaps um, stock options or income, perhaps um, any boards that they are affiliated with uh, will will likely be available, and then you know. The, the various services specialize in, in different things. So I would say, you know, think about this as all publicly available information, um, and these various subscription services are going out and collecting it um, and rolling it up in different ways to inform scores and ratings, as well as you know, underlying pieces of data that, that you can use um, to help inform questions about capacity as well as inclination. Um, you know, there are a number of different free services that we look at often. They, they include the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, which is a really wonderful place to go and look up uh, names and verify names, employment, and addresses. And then there are a lot of uh, really great records um, at the state level. So you can go to your Secretary of State's office, um, the courts, the departments, you know, various licensing departments, um, as well as GuideStar. Their GuideStar has some free services and some subscription services, but it's a great place to be able to look up um, to look up organizations and see who is affiliated with those various organizations. Um, also, you know, the county's assessor office is a great place to really kind of get a better sense of um, market value, of real estate, and, and how that might be applied to um, a capacity rating. Uh, finally, you know, public libraries. I don't think they get enough. They don't get enough publicity, and I think we're all moving away from them, unfortunately, but they really are a, a tremendous source of, of information. Um, you know, the, many of them actually have online resources there that, that are subscription services, um, so it's great to be able to leverage those. You know, often you can find the Foundation Center, for example, um, at your local public library, uh, or um, other, you know, really important records. and. Uh, sometimes genealogy services, which can give you really good insights into relationship mapping and, and how kind of how people are related and who might influence them. So I think that you know the, that sort of covers the subscription and the free services. I know Anne's got a few favorites. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, she really loves going to the library, uh, looking looking through newspaper archives to get um, really not only to get basic information about people, but to really kind of drill into those interest questions and, and you know, who's affiliated with who um, and how people might really, really tie into an organization. Wedding announcements, obituaries, they're a great way to create family trees. Um, also, birthdatabase.com I know is one of her favorites. And as I mentioned before, um, GuideStar for 990s and board affiliations. Again, some of these are free services and there are you can do deeper dives through paid subscriptions to GuideStar. It really gives you um, a lot of fabulous information, both at the organizational level and individual level. Um, I know that she spends time looking in at LinkedIn uh, to really kind of get a sense of those those relationships. And I think you know we're talking more and more about the importance of relationships and relationship mapping um, as we get better at at research. I think. We're, we're being asked more and more to think through the, the social network and um, begin to construct them for our partners on the front line and, and our managers. So really thinking through what are your resources around um, you know, who's related to who and who's on a board with whom, um, you know, how are all these relationships working together and how can they work together to benefit your organization is, is really important. 
Hey, let's just pause real quick. Is Ann back on the on the line yet? All right, I think I think we're still working on on her phone connection, but we'll we'll keep going. Great. Well, as I mentioned before, um, you know, we're very very focused at Campbell and Company about relationship management, and um, you know, this is a this is a visual that we use often, and really just sort of recognizes the the donor life cycle. Um, however, I don't think we spend enough time acknowledging that I think it really sort of starts with prospect research and the prospect research um, identification process. So, Anne, do you want to kind of walk us through this? Sure. Thank you. Um, so, research plays a kind of critical role in the various stages of the donor life cycle. Um, but we've kind of found in our experience that if it's not properly employed at the right times with the right focus, things can kind of easily go sideways. So it's good to remember that not like prospect researchers love to research. And as a prospect research, without boundaries and parameters, it's very easy for me to kind of fall into the rabbit hole and just kind of keep looking for information. So it is important to kind of think about building a thoughtful process, a thoughtful process for building out your uh, identified process full and important next that important next steps uh, for the entire team to minimize trouble spots and maximize effectiveness. So in order to make sure you're spending the right resources on the right person at the right time, we are going to spend a little bit. Uh, spend some time in a little more detail talking about how this all works together in relationship management. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, so yeah, so now that we've, we've talked a little bit about who you're looking for, now we really want to shift focus and talking, talk about how you do it efficiently and effectively as possible. And, and I think the, the place to start is identification. And I think it's just it's really important to acknowledge um, that the goal of identification, we've already mentioned it a few times, but just to be really explicit about it, the goal of the identification stage is to identify high potential, or excuse me, identify potential high capacity prospects. Um, and that, you know, we're really focused at, at this stage on capacity, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Before we do that, we want to acknowledge that there's a lot of different places that you can find those prospects, and we thought it would be really interesting to, to take a poll for a moment and see, you know, what are the sources of, of prospects that um, that you use. So some of our some of the ones that we we use often are um, the board members or volunteers, donors, staff or volunteer suggestions, um, we're looking at community leaders, and finally, you know, information from well screening or modeling. We talked about that a moment ago uh, with the, the various um, subscription services and vendors who are out there. So you might be doing well screening through a vendor, or maybe you're doing it in-house, either with your predictive modeling or even um, recency, frequency, and, and monetary scoring. So however you do that, um, there's just a lot of different places that you can look for, um, for sources. So thank you all so much for your responses. And it looks to me like uh, we're seeing our board members, board members and volunteers at 77% or 77% of you said um, some of your best sources of prospects are board members or volunteers. Um, you're also 60, 62% of you said that you're looking at donors, um, current and past donors, to help you think through where your best prospects may be. 37% uh, said they come from staff and volunteer suggestions. Um, community leaders, 19% of you said you're looking at community leaders as best sources of prospects. And, and finally, 44% said that you rely on screening and or modeling um, to help you think through where your, where your top prospects may be sitting. So thank you very much for, um, for those responses. I think before we you know, go into the, the rest of the process, I, we want to acknowledge that, um, that ideally we want this to be an ongoing practice, the idea of continuing to identify high capacity prospects. So we're not just looking for this one time to kickstart um, you know, sort of a massive relationship management movement. This is something that we want the prospect researcher or the person in that function to really own and drive and be revisiting on a regular basis to really think through how we're going to keep the pipeline um, full. Anne, you want to talk for just a minute about how we identify capacity? Sure. Thanks, Carrie. 
Um, so one of the most important things that researchers do is try to get a sense of what an individual's capacity is. And when we're talking about capacity and we're defining it, it is simply giving capacity is a donor's ability to make a gift to make a gift over a five-year period to all philanthropic interests. And when we're talking about um, capacity, we usually talk about it in ranges, which are based on known assets. So for example, we will quite often say things like, this person has a major giving capacity of $25,000 to $50,000. It is usually based, like typical formulas for determining capacity are usually based on a 1 to 2% 1 to for annual giving and a 5 to 10% of major gift capacity. And it's important to remember that capacity can be adjusted high or low, not only found on wealth indicators, but also affinity to your organization. So if you find somebody who's rated um, like $100,000 to $150,000 major gift capacity, but they are a longtime volunteer and they've served on your board, you might skew them a little bit higher at the higher end of that giving range. So some of the things to consider when we're talking about capacity is we want to think about like what what's his purpose like why why do we do this what does capacity tell us so not only does it tell us it gives it gives us a sense of the person's uh, ability or a sense of if they're able or capable of making a gift to your organization but it also provide it it serves as a directional indicator for your organization and kind of helps you prioritize your uh, relationship management and your donor prospects. Some important things to remember is what uh, it doesn't tell us. So the, for example, so capacity is based on publicly available information. It's really not a complete picture of a, of a person's complete wealth. It is based on publicly available known assets such as real estate, some stock holdings, for example, if that person is a director in a company, those will be reported to the Security and Exchange Commission, so that is publicly available information. Some um, business ownership information, and sometimes salary information if that happens to be um, published or publicly available. It does not tell us uh, things like private wealth, like prospect researchers are not able to find things like bank account balances, we're not able to find things like retirement accounts. We're not able to find things like private stock holdings. So you just kind of want to keep that in mind that capacity ratings really aren't um, finding everything that that person might own or have a, a, as a wealth indicator. Another thing to consider is things like real estate is usually the most easily found asset and it is a strong indicator of lifestyle and interest for this person. But real estate is not necessarily the most liquid asset. So a common saying among prospect researchers are things like no one's going to sell their house in order to make a gift to your campaign. So if you're basing your capacity rating solely on real estate, you want to uh, keep that in mind that um, having a very expensive piece of property is not always an indicator of liquid assets. So this is where kind of your excellent research skills come into play when you're looking for wealth indicators. Not only do you want to uh, check your assumptions about what you know about that person and always, always double check your sources to make sure that you are indeed have the right person. So looking for things like make sure middle initials match, make sure you're looking at the right person, look for property that might be held either by an LLC or another organization. So you just kind of want to always keep in mind what you can and uh, cannot find. And lastly, one of the most important things you want to remember is you want to have a game plan for your research. You want to decide on your time limit. Think about, okay, like I'm just doing uh, some qualification on this person. I want to get a sense of what their major giving capacity is. I'm going to see what I can find in 30 minutes or an hour or however long it takes you. But you do want to kind of limit yourself. You also want to decide on what your deliverable is. So quite often this is something that is just, it's a rating that's put into your donor database. It could be some other tracking system that your organizations use, but you want to make sure that you have some kind of method of reporting this information back so that it, does, it doesn't just live with one person 
of whoever is doing the research. And you also want to make sure that this is something that is regularly reviewed. So you want to set up a game plan for either you will do a, a six-month check-in on a person's capacity to see if they had any major lifestyle changes. You might do this on a yearly basis. It's just you need to decide what makes sense for your organization. So once you have a sense of what a person could be capable of making, uh, the size of a gift they could be capable of making, the next step is to uh, move into qualification. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, so yeah, qualification is the, the second stage of the relationship management cycle. And the goal of qualification is to confirm, uh, confirm capacity and assess inclination. So as we think through the, the importance of the team that we discussed earlier, at this point, the prospect researcher has done their due diligence, um, done some initial research, assessed uh, you know, a series of donor records, and come up with a capacity rating. And hopefully that rating is living somewhere in, in the system. Um, so now it's time for the frontline officer to be assigned for qualification, either a qualification visit or call, some kind of interaction, um, and the goal of which is to really um, try to confirm that capacity rating that was initially proposed by the prospect researcher and get some insights into inclination or interest um, by, the, by the prospective donor. So it's important to acknowledge that um, at this point, uh, additional research may be requested. We often um, talk about the importance of a, of a qualification brief, um, which is you know, a relatively short document um, focused on maybe giving a little bit of information about how the, the rating was arrived at, some basic information about estimated wealth and assets, uh, maybe a little bit of information about the giving history to the organization and their level of past or current involvement. Also, um, very kind of high-level background on educational, social, or professional affiliations, um, if you can find them quickly and easily. And, and I think a, a very little of it on philanthropic giving. For example, we often talk about um, looking at their largest five gifts and what types of organizations um, somebody has been giving them to as a, as a way to get some baseline information about um, perhaps their, their level of philanthropic inclination generally and the areas that they're particularly interested in. So all of that can be um, synthesized into, again, a very short, we're talking a few paragraphs, probably no more than a page um, or two at the most. And we, we call those qualification briefs. Other people call them other things. But, but the point, to Anne's point earlier, um, the goal for the prospect researcher here is you know, to, to be really responsible with the amount of time they, they spend on these qualification briefs. Because at this moment, um, it's really important to just get in front of the, the prospective donor, have a conversation, and figure out um, whether or not it looks like they, they are a legitimate prospect uh, for the organization. So we don't want our prospect researcher to take it inordinate amounts of time um, to, to provide the front line with you know, full profiles at this point. We think that you know, that's, um, that's not an effective use of the prospect researcher's time, and often it can delay um, the frontline officer just getting out and in front of somebody. So, we are huge fans of the, the value and the usefulness of a qualification brief, but really just want to make sure that that, that deliverable is clearly defined and that the, the prospect researcher is not taking too much time um, too much time on it. So once the uh, once the officer has the qualification brief, obviously they're going to go out and they're going to meet with the prospect and hopefully qualify, but sometimes just as helpful, um, perhaps disqualify that person. In any case. The, this stage, coming out of the stage, we will know whether or not somebody looks like a legitimate prospect for your organization as we head into cultivation. So the goal of cultivation is to develop and execute strategies which further engage prospects and really move them towards solicitation. This is the stage where we get more focused on moving the relationship, um, involving natural partners, and you know, really honing in on um, who they may know and how we might better engage them. Um, so that's the, that's the responsibility of the officer. They're working on you know, a, a set of key moves and interactions that are going to further the, the relationship with the prospective donor and deepen their level of engagement. The prospect researcher is monitoring information at this point. Um, often they're looking for triggers, um, you know, indications that might suggest a lifestyle change. Um, and you know, 
indications of lifestyle change might have implications for capacity or inclination, as we've discussed earlier. So the researcher at this point might be looking for things like buying or selling a real estate, um, employment changes, buying or selling a company or a new job, uh, and moving on or off boards, which I think is something you don't we don't often think about. But obviously, people's social networks change um, based on the boards they're on. So I think it's really important to try to sort of stay abreast of where your key volunteers are and, and who their connections may be. And, and each time um, their network changes, it, it opens up new possibilities for you. So being aware of that is really important. Um, at this point, you know, monitoring information is really, really important. And we acknowledge that there is some additional research that can be requested. Um, we'd like to keep this research fairly targeted. Um, so either focus on those updates uh, that are going to be provided because of the prospect researcher and, and information that they found when monitoring um, the cultivation, prospects and cultivation, or if there are targeted or special projects. So let's say we've got a particular event coming up or a communication piece that's particularly relevant to this prospect. There may be um, some additional research that's required to be able to really tie in that prospect to that event. Um, or make sure that you know the interests align in some way, shape, or form. So we want to be leveraging events and communications that are already in um, in the queue. And if additional research is needed to be able to figure out which set of prospects might best fit with those, then um, we fully support that. Again, the the goal here is to be mindful of specifically what your deliverables are and the amount of time um, that that's being invested at the beginning stages of, of cultivation. And we're still fairly, um, we want our prospect researcher to be fairly mean with the, the amount of time that they're, they're focusing on prospects in early cultivation. Again, that, that's, uh, our sense is that that's where the, the frontline officer is really doing the lion's share of the work and moving that relationship forward and is, is leaning on the prospect researcher um, when specific and additional information is required. So then we're going to move into solicitation, which is obviously really exciting at this point. Um, you know, all the hard work of the prospect researcher, the officer, and their management team who supported them is coming together. Um, the goal of solicitation, obviously, is to make the ask. Um, at this point, the officer is ready to make a solicitation. Um, they've, you know, they've done all their due diligence. They've, they've moved the prospect along. And we typically think about solicitation, moving into solicitation, when you're about three months out from, from being ready to make the ask. Um, They've probably involved natural partners as appropriate at this point and are really kind of tying up um, any loose ends in their final strategy for uh, getting ready to make, make the ask and make that big push. At this point, um, additional research may be requested. And typically what we see in this stage is I think what we often think about as a traditional profile. This is a much larger and longer document, I would say more strategic, um, and, and really links the purpose of the solicitation um, as defined by the, you know, the individual engagement strategy. Um, so the, the frontline officer has decided with, you know, with the help of natural partners how to best engage this prospect and what we're going to be asking them for. And at this point, um, as we look to that final visit or set of visits, we might want additional research to do a, real, a, a deeper dive into their interests and inclinations to make sure that we've tied in um, our proposal, our solicitation, as appropriately as possible um, to this prospect's interest, set of interests. So I think the, the full profile can be really, really helpful here when you near or are in solicitation. Again, um, we just want to be mindful of timing. These can be very, very uh, time intensive. And it can take anywhere from four to eight hours to produce one of these documents. So. That's why we suggest that we really we wait till further along in the, the cycle when we're quite quite sure that we are going to be going to a prospect and we know exactly what um, what we want to ask them for. Uh, but that said, it can be a very very useful tool and really can help to align um, the frontline and their natural partners as we key up for that that final visit and can really be used to help inform and drive strategy around that ask. So then. Hopefully you make the ask and they say yes, which is wonderful. We always like that. And then we head into stewardship, where you know obviously the goal is to appropriately steward that gift, continue to engage the prospect. We talk about 
um, stewardship, we all we often compare it to, to qualifications. So that idea of continuing to deepen the relationship, engage the prospect, um, and develop strategy and timing for requalification to keep them involved in the, the relationship management cycle is, is really important. Um, so at this point, you know, the officer is focused on thanking the donor and their, the officer and their natural partners are continuing to engage and steward. The prospect researcher is monitoring information, much like I, like I mentioned in cultivation, um, looking for life, indications of lifestyle change and, and updating um, documentation as appropriate or updating ratings um, as appropriate as, as, a, as they learn more about the set of prospects. And I know, um, and you can probably speak for a moment about this, but I know the idea of monitoring um, is really, really helpful. And uh, maybe, Anne, if you could just talk for a moment about some of the tools that you're using to, to really key in on those monitoring. Oh, sure. Thanks, Carrie. So a couple things that are just kind of practical tips for um, tools is to kind of, I do create, set up Google Alerts. So if there's an individual that I just kind of want to keep track of, um, I will get a notification if they hit any of the local news sources. Uh, the Business Journal's publication, which I know are in, and it's a national organization that's in major cities. Uh, here in Seattle, we have the Puget Sound Business Journal, and um, I monitor that regularly. I follow them on Twitter. I get their email updates. And there's a way that you can kind of tag individuals. So if there's a new publication, you can kind of um, follow them. So again, what, to Carrie's point, you are looking for lifestyle changes, you're looking for employment changes, you're looking for anything that could indicate that um, uh, something major has happened. Because one thing to keep in mind when you're in the stewardship phase is if you have a donor who made a five-year pledge, uh, made a gift and it's a five-year pledge, that gives you an opportunity to stay engaged with them. And so um, you have the opportunity to go back to them in year three, four, and five and talk about uh, possibly approaching them again, talking to them about a stretch gift, or just, again, you have the opportunity to check back in with them. So keeping track of your donors once they've made the gift is just as critical as um, uh, or finding your donors when you're in a uh, identification or cultivation stage. Great. Thank you. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge that, and I think you essentially already alluded to this, but um, additional research may be requested in, in stewardship as well. So beyond just the monitoring that, that Anne was talking about a moment ago, um, there may be special projects, targeted projects, again, usually focused around upcoming events or communications. And, and again, the idea is thinking through who's the right group of prospects in stewardship to be receiving either specific invitations or specific communications, and typically that's really um, focused around interest. So if there's additional research that's needed to be able to align a prospect interest with, um, with a set of communications and event strategies, I think that can be really, really helpful. So with that, Anne, you want to walk us through? So we've, we've gone through the entire relationship management process. We understand that how uh, prospect research plugs in. Um, we understand the importance of defining both our deliverable and our time. And oh, and I think Sarah has a couple questions for us before we talk about next steps. Yeah, sorry guys, sorry to interrupt. We just had a question from the audience in terms of what are the key attributes that make a great researcher? Well, I think that's a question for Anne. Oh, sure. Well, as somebody who has a master's in library and information science, I will always uh, shout out of librarians, make excellent researchers. But um, prospect research is, is a learned skill. So um, there's some kind of fundamental skill sets that make it uh, easier and make it, you can be more efficient at your job. So people who are very detail oriented and can evaluate sources, because one thing about doing prospect research mostly in an online environment is that there is a lot of noise out on the internet and you have to be able to filter out what is a real accurate source of information versus what is just rumor mill or or whatnot. So you want to you want someone who can discern um, 
valuable and accurate information. So someone who is efficient with their time, has excellent research skills, and is a good communicator. Because again, one of the most critical pieces of doing prospect research within your development team is being able to report back that information in a way that is useful and effective for uh, everybody involved. So there is, if you are more interested, if you're interested in this topic, I'd be happy to talk to anybody. Um, my contact information is available on our website. But I would also encourage you to check out APRA's website, which is just um, APRA.org. And they actually have resources available that is fundamental skill sets for researchers. So it kind of outlines job descriptions and kind of um, the qualities that uh, make good researchers. Excellent. Thanks, Anne. And I, I have one more question that I think is, is, is the top of mind from what we just covered in the session so far. Um, and the question is, can you comment on some of the newer subscription services that explore relationships via LinkedIn, et cetera, to see who knows who, who your trustees, donors know, et cetera? Um, sure. I think relationship mapping is really exciting, and I know that there is a lot of interest uh, among prospect researchers about utilizing this feature and utilizing this tool. So there, um, just to talk about the, the resources for a moment, there are a lot of vendors out there who are um, growing this field. So I know in some of the well screening services, they are uh, linking if you do a modeling service, they will actually link your donors, tell you who's connect, who knows who. Um, there are some standalone services like Prospect Visual. LinkedIn is moving in this direction. But I would also caution you to just go back and think about prioritizing the needs and the budget of your organization. And Carrie, you might have some additional thoughts on this, but um, you want to always make sure that you are spending uh, the right amount of time and money on the resources that are going to move your organization forward. So if relationship mapping is something that you're trying to focus on because you want to look for those natural partnerships and look for um, rela like relationships among not only your donors but your board members, then I would encourage you to kind of reach out to some of these services and see if the, like a trial version is available and see if this is just something that you can test to see if it works for your organization. Yeah, and I would add to that. I mean, I think that the, these particular services are kind of run the gamut in, in terms of price. Some of them are quite expensive, and so, again, we need to be mindful of budget. And I also think at the end of the day, while it, it can be incredibly informative and really, frankly, fun to see the visuals, um, I think to Anne's point, we need to be thoughtful about what, what, inf what the information we're going to receive from them is going to allow us to do. So for example, if you find out that somebody is like one or two people removed from your, um, from a board member, you know, th that may not give you such different information than if we started with our board members who we think will be natural partners and have them peer screen a list of prospective um, donors. So I, I think that they absolutely provide value and can provide additional insights, but we do have to manage them manage expectations around them, and then manage the budget around them. Excellent. Thanks, guys. And we, we have a couple more questions, but we'll wait until further along in the presentation. Great. Thanks. Well, I think we were, we're nearing the end here. We just want to be able to, to um, walk through what the next steps are now that we've talked about prospect research and its importance in the relationship management cycle. Anne, you want to walk us through what comes next? Yeah. So. Basically, we just want to talk about like you've done all your research and you've done you've put that into practice and you've successfully cultivated and solicited and stewardship your donors. And so now what? So I think your first immediate step is to assess the prospect research function in your development department. So how many full-time employees do you really have that are able to do research? Uh, do you have people that are serving in hybrid roles and prospect research is not their sole function? Um, so what kind of bandwidth does that really afford you to do research? And so not only will you think about like how many people do we have available to do this, so you know if you only have one half-time researcher but you want them to be able to do doing 10 
and uh, cultivation or solicitation briefs a week, that is kind of an unrealistic expectation. So you also need to think about what you need, how many people do you have to do that, and then you also need to think about like who do you have in those roles and going back to matching that skill set uh, for prospect research and matching that appropriately to, to the person. You also want to set expectations for everybody. Um, you want to talk, talk through with leadership, with frontline gift officers, with your prospect researchers to um, talk about how this is all going to be put in play together. You want to include your prospect researcher in relationship management meetings. Uh, what I hear most frequently from other researchers is that they sometimes feel like they're working in a silo. Um, they are responding to kind of prospect research requests passively and they don't understand or know where that donor is in the donor life cycle. And so if you involve prospect research in your relationship management or your prospect strategy meetings, whatever you call them, um, it just is a, another piece of the puzzle to kind of um, keep everything moving forward. And you also want to have regular check-ins about evaluating what, what is working and what isn't working and how the team is working together. So if the organization could um, give officers give feedback to prospect researchers about uh, what kind of research they need, you just want to carry on that conversation. So you, think, you want to think about what you measure and how everything works together because I think at the end, of the end of the day, the most important thing to remember is that this fundraising is a group effort that takes everybody in your organization. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So it looks like we have a few more questions if you guys don't mind. I know that we're, we're running close to the end of the hour here. Um, so the first question is, is uh, are there any best practices for advancing a first-time donor to a high-level renewal gift? Um, I think, if I understand the question, any best practices around, like I think if we talk about the importance of leveraging prospect research, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say if, if you've got a first-time donor, and again, we talked about the importance of viewing your, your various sources, right? So you have a first-time donor that comes in and you have some indication that they, they may have higher capacity and your prospect researcher um, is able to, to give that, that new donor um, capacity rating. And it turns out that that person does look like they have resources and that therefore certainly it's a relationship you want to try to fast track. Um, I would say, you know, that the easiest way to try to do it is to, to see if you can um, get them to interact with a frontline officer and see if they can be qualified. Outside of that, if you have you know full portfolios or um, there isn't a frontline officer available, I think the idea you know we spend a lot of time talking about the importance of um, having an identified prospect pool that is unmanaged. And so it sounds to me like this might mm -hmm. be this might be an example of that where you have indications that someone has capacity. You know, for whatever reason, they, there isn't bandwidth right now to have somebody go out and engage or qualify them. And so we really want to make sure that we don't lose track of them. And so I would say you know, they, they're an identified prospect. Um, the prospect researcher is going to sort of put them on their list of people to monitor. And then you can really be thoughtful about um, those communications and, and event strategies that we talked about. So thinking through, you know, this is a targeted group and how do you how can you focus on beginning to cultivate the group, beginning to engage the group, even if it's not one-on-one, -on -one, through special invites um, or communications? And, and, and the goal of that is really to see who self-identifies and therefore mm -hmm. kind of rises to the top of the priority list. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next question is, is, we have a really small shop, but we do pay for screening software. None of us really have the time to utilize it effectively, as we all play so many roles. Do you have any suggestions for how to incorporate better prospect researching practices? Yeah, I'll take a first pass at that, and then Anne, um, if you have additional insights, I welcome them. I think uh, I think there's a couple important things about prospect research when you're in a in a smaller shop. Obviously, when you wear a lot of different hats, mm -hmm. um, I think that in practice, prospect research often just sort of gets pushed to the side. Uh, you know that we're all responding to urgent requests and 
um, things that are sort of immediate, and therefore, in particular, the idea of prospect identification, um, anything kind of proactive, which I would say prospect research often might often fall um, into that category. It tends to get not it doesn't get pushed off the priority list. It just gets sort of pushed further down. And so, I think first of all, um, making sure that you have some amount of time dedicated to to that effort is really important. Acknowledging you know, even if it's only 10 or 15%, if that's all you can do, acknowledging that that's what it's going to be, and really, to Anne's point earlier about setting expectations, what, what can you accomplish in that mm -hmm. amount of time, and where do you want to focus those skills? So um, do, you, do you need to build your pipeline, and therefore, do you really want to focus in on prospect identification? Do you have um, prospects that are nearing solicitation, and therefore, whatever, whatever bandwidth you have is going to have to be focused on, you know, deeper, um, profiles and, and more strategic views of, of your prospects. Um, and then I think in terms of leveraging the tools, I think those tools can be really, really useful, but can also be really intimidating. And so I would say, first of all, um, many of the vendors have really great online help, and um, you can leverage that. They've got webinars, they've got all kinds of YouTube videos, so obviously that's, that's one way to, to try to leverage um, your online resources. And I think, frankly, prioritizing the way you're going to use those is really important. So maybe you don't have to understand the you know, 400 data points that you're going to get in any one of those resources, but you start with capacity and get a sense of what that means. And then move on to understanding you know, the philanthropic inclinations or the board affiliation. So just sort of take it step by step, and eventually you'll work your way through the, the tool. And do you have any additional thoughts? No, I I just would add or just kind of build off what you said about um, the importance of being strategic about what you need to know. So, for example, I've worked with several clients who have small shops and um, they just don't have a de full time dedicated researcher. So, they decide what what is troubling them about their donor management. So, for some organizations, it's they want to know if their donors are giving on if their donors are, are have a higher capacity to give more. So they focus their prospect research not only on capacity but also looking at other give, at philanthropic giving. Um, sometimes it's about relationship building, and you want you have a board who is a little perhaps you have a board that's just a little uncomfortable going out on meetings, and so you want to really make sure that you're you're aligning natural partners, so you are really focused on um, building the, the relationships and building the partners. So I would just spend your, your best time, your time well spent, is what I'm trying to say, is figuring out um, what you most need to know and then just be strategic about spending your time on that and doing it as efficiently as possible. Yeah, and the one thing that I would add to that is if it turns out that you really just don't have the time to focus on this, um, you should probably figure out if there are ways to outsource it because we, we really believe in the value of this as a practice, both in building the pipeline and advancing relationships. And I think sometimes in our in our smaller shops, um, there's just too much to get done, mm -hmm. and we don't want to see we don't want to see this function uh, fall by the wayside. All right. Well, thank you, um, and thank you to. Carrie and Anne for leading such a, uh, a thoughtful discussion. We have um, just a few more minutes I just wanted to button up before we end today. Thank you for everyone who joined us today. Uh, we are excited to con continue this series, the Relationship Management Webinar Series, with managing the right prospects. And this will be on Wednesday, November 12th at 12 p.m. Central Time. And you can go ahead and head to our website to register. Uh, with that, I'd like to just say thank you to everyone, and we hope that you are enjoying your fall. Looking forward to talking soon. Thanks.